actually proof that junk food is good for you. <laughs> My car is still one piece, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of like indicative of the luck that I have. Um, in a recent interview, I was asked whether or not, they, a series of questions of whether or not I'm an asshole. It's a good thing to find out before you're hiring someone. And so he's asking the questions all these weird ways. I'm like, look, let me cut to the chase. Look, I've been stabbed, I've had a number of guns pointed at me in weird situations, and I've accidentally wound up in a minefield of turkey still drunk from the night before. It takes a lot to get under my skin. So I'm just a guy who works really, really hard and every now and then has crazy good and bad luck at the same time. And so this talk is gonna be basically about with a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, how you can do something similar to what I've done. So, are we rolling good to go? Yeah. Okay. So, the title of this talk is Lessons from Training Ninjas, or basically how to revamp your security curriculum. Um, the target audience for this talk is really educators, perhaps professors or instructors. Um, I myself, I am a graduate student. Um, and I founded uh, the Cybersecurity Club at my university. And at, at the club meetings, people would just show up and they'd just be like, no one had any initiative to you know, propose to do things. They just kind of showed up and expected to be like a classroom. So I started teaching things to get everyone to a level where they were basically confident that they could start doing things. And so it turned into a class, basically the club itself. And so someone suggested, why don't you just take what you're doing and teach an actual class? And so this is basically what has come of this. So the purpose of this talk is to provide you with wisdom, insights, and tricks so you could do the same. Because uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm here is because I was invited to talk and the class was, I guess, really impressive to the organizers. So, at some point, I was appointed as the director of a research lab on my university, and that basically means I'm the unpaid system administrator who helps the professors get their stuff done. Um, I founded the, the CTF group called No Pointer. Um, I primarily come from a system administrator and computer science background. And perhaps the most important thing on here is I have a lot of experience being a student. And that's, that really comes uh, into play when you're actually teaching a class, being able to relate to the students, especially at this level. Um, and I'm here today because I'm teaching this class. So, <clears throat> most security classes at major universities focus a lot on crypto and are a general survey of topics at a high level. Um, sometimes they'll make you actually do a lot of crypto and that's hands-on in-depth stuff but you don't get exposed to stuff like intrusion detection signature writing, um, writing uh, SQL injection, and stuff like that. And so what I noticed at my own university is people were being graduated with degrees, sometimes in InfoSec, and I found them to be not as high level as I, should, as I would like for my fellow classmates. Um, and so, and this isn't, this isn't just specific to my university. A lot of universities produce students who usually can't do security training, and that's why we have all these certs. So this talk is actually an ode to uh, Dan Guido's 2009 talk at Source Boston, So You Want to Train an Army of Ninjas. And he uh, took over a class, that was an existing class that had fallen apart, called Application Security and Vulnerability Analysis. And the website for it is pentest.cryptocity.net. It's a fantastic class. He videotaped every single lecture. The class was taught by himself and five basically industry professor, professionals. Like they had a guy who was really good at RE, guy that was really good at malware analysis, guy that was really good at web application security. And, uh, they came in and they taught what they are really, really good at. And uh, it is kind of, um, for open source classes, it is whenever you talk to people, it always comes up in a conversation. And it's quite successful. And so my talk title is Lessons from Training an Army of Ninjas is simply a note to this talk. So if you want to see the website, instead of typing in, you can use this QR code. Um, I have a bigger one on the next slide. So in, in my class, I decided to raise the bar for the students. And uh, we went in a, in a very aggressive direction. I went hands-on and in-depth on x86 reverse engineering, 
exploit development, network hacking, web application hacking, and then at the end, I taught them the tools. I dragged them kicking and screaming through all the fundamentals because I didn't want to train script kiddies. So the, 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 the perspective I taught is teaching all this stuff from a very red team heavy perspective because I believe that if you understand how to attack a system well, you're much better equipped at defending it. Um, and so if you want to see the website, I don't see anyone with their phone out. So the result is some of the students in my class started off as noobs and now they're actually very, very good. Um, I would consider them ninjas. And so I didn't do it alone. Um, I don't have five industry professional friends that I could have brought in. I had the help of one, and then my uh, professor who allowed me to do it, and then a uh, fellow PhD student. And I didn't get their permission to use their faces, so I just used the appropriate images. <sighs> and so why am I here today? Why am I talking? Because there's some really interesting results came from this class. Um, we had some really good work on uh, improving security in the Android kernel, especially addressing the, the non-existent permission solution for Android. Um, and that comes from uh, students' work to basically port Mockdroid uh, from Froyo up to the most recent Android, which is a very difficult task in itself. Um, and these are all individual term projects that students chose to do. Uh, some uh, actually chose to do uh, extension of volatility and a lot of these ideas I got from talking to my friends in uh, the industry asking if you had an intern and you had 10 weeks for them to do whatever you wanted what would be a really badass class project for them to do that they could list on their resume it would help anyone out and if you're an incident responder or malware an analyst uh, and they could, they could get it done, it would be a realistic uh, project for them in 10 weeks, and they could have something to really be proud of. Because the majority of term projects in classes are BS things that are just easy for the professor to grade. Granted, these are open-ended projects, so it's very difficult for me to grade them. Um, and it's especially difficult for people to grade if, if someone else were to take what I'm doing and do it, and someone follows uh, project that's not within any of the realm of expertise of the professor. So there's some difficulty in approaching this in itself. <clears throat> but uh, there are some really good uh, projects like um, students writing custom encoders for uh, polymorphic payloads. Um, and which brings me to the challenges of teaching this class. I didn't take an existing class and one that was decaying and revamp it. I created a brand new one from scratch, and that has a whole new set of difficulties. Um, and if you're going about this route, usually one of the main hurdles to teaching a new class is you have to get your faculty members or your chair of your department to care. And the way to do that easy is to speak money. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, there's a lot of funding sources, the NSA uh, Centers of Excellence, Centers of Academic Excellence, they have CyberOps now, that's brand new, InfoSec Research. So FSU already had uh, InfoSec and Research, and we were going for CyberOps, and this class was a huge help to getting that. However, I don't know if the NSA really knows a clear vision of what they're going for CyberOps, because we in the academic community feel clueless, because they keep changing the bar that we have to jump to. There's also NSF grant money, and then there's actual funding for SFS, which has now been re renamed to CyberCorp. Um, and these are all wonderful things. However, I should note that this NSA Cyber Academic Excellence is going to be uh, completely changed, and they're wiping the slate clean in like two years. They're taking away everyone's status and redoing it all. Um, so this will probably change between now and then. <clears throat> Next challenge is you have to organize the topics that you want to talk about. And this is not an intuitive challenge in itself. Um, and lastly, you have to bridge the knowledge gaps. This was one of the more challenging things. I assumed the students had a basic competency in a number of things. Um, I assumed that they had talked about security in their software development classes. And a lot of things that they didn't know surprised me. And we had to, as with any class, deal with that. 
So, in essence, we want to produce students with a ability to actually do all the material that we're teaching. Uh, but in order to do that, there's basically, you have to address the Swiss cheese knowledge foundation that they have and bridge all those gaps. I found perhaps the best way to do that is to not actually spend time, okay, we're gonna spend this week reviewing this, setting up virtual machines and stuff like that. Um, I actually inspired them by hacking stuff regularly, doing demos like, hey, I just popped a shell. This is how I did it. Showing people these things actually inspires them to, hey, actually go, that's fascinating. I'm gonna go do this on my own and look it up. Um, <clears throat> and so, before I just start rambling, I'm gonna follow the rest of my slides. <laughs> so, the outline of basically how to plan a new class and see it through uh, is basically, you have to, I think, address some eight key things. And then uh, Dan Guido pre presented a very good how-to, and I'm going to basically touch on what he presented and how I took it and made it work for me. Who knows this guy? If I was, if I was going to stick around, if I could, I'd, I'd buy you a beer. Um, so you have to seriously determine how many core areas do you want to cover. Um, do you want to stick to a textbook, or do you want to go your own way? Crypto is always the big dog in the room when talking about security. Every security class teaches it, and they teach it for a reason. It works. However, teaching it takes weeks. If you leave out crypto in a class like this, you could cover more other material. Um, but if you do teach crypto, you have to keep it in every single thing. It touches everything. Um, so the reason I left it out in my class uh, <clears throat> is that the rest of the security classes in my university all were extremely crypto heavy. And they felt like copies of each other. So I decided to completely leave it out because the students would get a very strong crypto uh, background from just taking the other classes. So other core areas you might want to consider is teaching reverse engineering. Code auditing is also extremely important um, for any offensive or defensive security. Um, do you want to teach actual exploit development? How about malware analysis and so on and so on. And for, for all the core areas that you choose, you have to identify some advanced topics that you want to shoot for. For instance, I wanted to shoot for explaining ROP to students and making sure they come away with an understanding of that. Um, and then executable security mitigations, ASLR, DEP, NX. I was shocked that students were being produced uh, with a degree and they had no idea what these things were. And I, <clears throat> Also chose to uh, go, uh, let's see, in depth on a number of other things, but they came along as the class went. Um, so I kind of set a loose plan at first. You have to establish what you expect the students to already know. Um, that way you can have basically a better way of keeping track of how the students are failing your expectations or how they are meeting them. Um, and then, if you can, perhaps establish a prerequisite for the class. I found out at the last second that I couldn't because the class was brand new and had to be an elective. So I told the students the first day, if you haven't taken the security class before, you will fail this class. You will get an F and you will probably cry. Um, and it's good that I said that because like five people dropped. Um, and then you have to find out what's, you have to come to terms with what you think is the best way to assess the grasshoppers results and their progress. Um, I say homeworks, and in my homeworks, they're basically CTFs. I participate in a lot of CTFs, and this entire semester, every weekend that I could, I was doing CTFs, and sometimes I was working on problems all on my own, and I'd solve them, and then I'd take them, and I'd use them against my students. I'd obfuscate them so they couldn't find out what it would, you know, look up a write-up or anything, and there are a number of times that there was no write-up, and I was... I and my friends were the only ones solved it, and so I reused it against the class and perhaps extra credit. <clears throat> Projects and presentations are kind of long-term things. 
unless if you do presentations frequently. Uh, Dan Guido's class does uh, presentations, they, I believe, every, every class. Um, the student is basically picked to find something out, present for five minutes. And the reason I think presentations are extremely important is if you produce hackers who cannot communicate, they're pretty worthless. And the best way to assess their, ability, their knowledge of the skills and their ability to communicate is to make them do a presentation. It's pretty easy to determine whether or not they're bullshitting you just by having them talk through a subject. Um, when I started teaching this class, I definitely didn't know 100% of the material. I was probably at 50%. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, but I'm very efficient at teaching myself things. And the ability to do the material, I, know, I knew I could do about 75% of all of it. Um, but I just had to figure it out first. Um, no one can know everything. Your ability to do things is probably, your, your, probably larger than your knowledge base. Um, the human brain can only store so much information each day. So about the instructor. If you have a group of industry professionals to teach this with you, that's great. Um, but there has to be a primary instructor, and its main purpose is basically to guide the class, to organize all the topics, make sure it flows well, make sure people see the big picture. So the, se the, the sensei must be current. Um, it's, it's important to have a uh, presence in the community, attend conferences, um, read daily security news, and keep the students involved in that, um, get them involved in basically the pace, get them to have a, a good perspective on the pace of the security community. Um, and another way to be current is to participate in CTS. And there was a talk yesterday, intro to CTS, way more resources he provided than just this one link to uh, get, in, get into CTS. So <clears throat> these are just some of all the books that I use to teach this class. I have probably six more, um, but another note is that I'm not a good public speaker, um, and I hadn't actually taught a class before. And you don't have to be a great public speaker to teach a hands-on, you know, fast-paced class like this. Um, but you should have a teaching method that's appropriate for the aggressiveness of what you want to set out and do. If you want to you know, have an in-depth, fast-paced <coughs> class on exploit development and everything like that, um, and you've planned everything out, the Socratic method may not work. Although it's an extremely useful teaching method, and it helps people think things through, if you need, if you have a lot of material to get through, it may be better to have a lot of demos and to videotape them so they can go and see what's happening over and over and over until it sets in. So the setup for my class is I heavily rely on VM virtual machines. Um, the university provides MSDNAA, it is now called DreamSpark, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you can get free versions of Windows through there. And that's great for the students when I introduce them to Windows concepts, uh, working with malware and Windows and stuff like that. Um, and uh, there's all these wonderful distros out there. Backtrack is now just replaced by Kali, and I haven't toyed around with that. Um, and then this is a great textbook because it comes with a live CD. It just, it's simple. It has ASLR disabled by default. And if you try to explain how to disable ASLR when you're starting the class, students are just gonna be like, what are you talking about? So it's nice to have a live CD with just disabled by default. And it contains all the source code for the textbook and textbooks, code examples are packed with vulnerable programs and exploit code, and you can sit there and do them all day long, and students really learn a lot from this. And so, my class, I taught about 30 students, and we only had, we didn't have a lab. I wish this class could have been a lab. Um, and so, I had to fit all the material into 75 minute lectures twice a week. And so, what I did is, I talked very, very fast, went through the material very, very fast, and I videotaped every lecture, when possible. Um, and a lot of people have asked me after looking at my website how I did it. Um, I use this software called Microsoft Expression Encoder. I know a free Microsoft product that works. Um, 
because it works, they are discontinuing it, I think. So uh, I'm not sure how available that is anymore. <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to pull up the class website. This is the, the, the lecture slide website. I have Flashblock on right now. But I have all the lecture videos on YouTube, along with the required reading, overview of the lecture, uh, uh, the lecture slides, any related exercises for that lecture, along with any uh, extra reading material. So sometimes for like related resources, I just point students to DEF CON talks <coughs> to get them exposed to the wonderful things that go on at DEF CON. And when I was talking about uh, SSL and the state of certificate authorities, the required reading was Moxie Marlin Spike's talk, and the related reading was Moxie Marlin Spike and Whitfield Diffie's fireside chat at you know, DEF CON with whiskey and everything. And so, um, I wish myself that more professors, more instructors would use these wonderful resources, these wonderful talks that are recorded, videotaped, and put online by the security community in the everyday classroom. Um, so that's what I try to do myself. So the main tactics I use day to day, <coughs> tactics are short term strategies, and then I have long term strategies that I talk about next. So I use frequent demos to reinforce what I'm talking about with the students. You can talk all day about hacking stuff, but once you show them how to do it and show it right there in front of them, they're like, wow, that's awesome. It really sets in. Another useful thing is have a mold to get feedback. Um, unfortunately, I have like seven friends in my class. And they all tell me how it's going. Some days they tell me, you're really crushing the undergraduates. I'm like, well, that's kind of good, but I'll lay off. But uh, it also is kind of hard grading seven of your friends. Um, because it's like, man, you should know that. You're an idiot. <laughs> Another tactic I use is in order to give them perspective on real world security, I usually spend like the five, first five minutes of every lecture talking about some important recent development. So right when APT1 report came out, I talked about that. Um, right when Java Zero Days come out, I talk about those and the importance of you know Everybody watching day. CVEs. Well, yeah, Java Zero Days is like days since last Java Zero Days, usually less than two. Uh, so there was one lecture I was looking at the uh, the CVE list, and the first four pages were all Java. <laughs> So another tactic that I use, and so I have one student in the class right now, and he's probably angry at me right now. I made things do earlier than I expected them to do, to be done. This way, when I gave extensions frequently, they're like, oh my god, he's the best student. He's the best teacher ever. He cares about us. No, I'm just I'm manipulating you. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually works well. So, the other thing that I got a lot of great feedback on is hands-on workshops. Setting these up were hard because I didn't have a lab. I didn't have you know 30 computers that I could have students do their own thing at. I had to actually uh, work with them weeks in advance to get them to have laptops for this week and have you know everything set up, all the virtual machines set up right. And what we did is week three we had a guest lecture come in. And we dive right into the deep end of x86 reverse engineering, like hands-on looking at binaries in IDA and everything like that. Um, and so this was one of the most successful weeks. And if you have the opportunity to do a lab, there are tons of resources out there that you don't have to, that you can use so you don't have to put it together a lab every single time by yourself. I strongly urge reusing labs from existing resources. Practical malware analysis has tons of great labs. It's a wonderful book. It's universal widely regarded as the de facto standard on malware reversing and reverse engineering. Um, there's labs from pentest.cryptocity.net itself. Um, there's another good uh, resource here, uh, opensecuritytraining.info. The guy that teaches that is strictly Windows side, um, and he has some great lectures on the entire life of a Windows binary. Um, also, uh, coreland.be is wonderful, and if you go through one of the exploit tutorials, that would make a great lab in itself. Um, and so, also, all these traditional level-based CTF exercises also make great labs. 
smash the stack. I would love to have seen that in a, a lab setting when I was a student um, taking classes. Uh, export exercises is also is much newer. They have uh, three uh, exercise virtual machines, uh, Nebula, CrowStar, and Fusion, I believe. And these are great resources to save the instructor a lot of time, and they're all set up basically with instructions on how to solve them. Um, <clears throat> So, I guess this should be more strategy, but you have to determine whether or not you want to have a term project, and if you want it to be individual work only. <clears throat> I am a strong uh, proponent of individual work only term projects because I've been way too many team projects and always had to deal with the freeloaders. Um, and so, individual work is a good way to get rid of the slackers and to also make everyone work on challenging stuff um, and prove their own skill. And so I went with open-ended term projects and allowed them to work on projects that would help the industry, would produce tools and plugins like plugins of volatility that will take a take the output from proc mem dump and actually rebuild the IAT table so you can import it into IDA without going through uh, Imprec <coughs> or Imprec Lite if you can actually ever get that to work and saves it, anyone doing instant response a lot of time. Uh, you can directly pump uh, any thing from Malfind to Ida, and all the, all the symbols are there. <clears throat> and uh, so that, that was a great result from the class. Uh, the class is still going on, the semester's not done. We're in the middle of student presentations week. Two weeks from now is the final. Um, so I don't have a lot of the other results ready to brag about yet. Um, but if you do open-ended, you have to provide sample projects like that. You can't just say, go, Solve security. Ten weeks. Chop chop. Uh, it's not going to work. Um, and <clears throat> I found that with open-ended projects, you really have to provide detailed rubrics so students know how to get the A. And so I provided that all on my website, and you're free to copy it. <clears throat> I already talked about presentations, distinguishing the BSers from the students who know their stuff. And so the long-term strategy is I wanted to cover a lot of advanced topics, and I saw the best way to do it is just to blitzkrieg through the material. Um, so week one and two was kind of like fluffy overview of Windows and Linux and rootkits and code auditing, and then the difficulty of the class is pretty much like this. And I warned them that it was going to be extremely difficult very soon. And I could see the eyes glaze over on some of the undergraduates very quickly, and um, but they stuck through it, and actually some of the some of the undergraduates who aren't even computer science, like criminology, they're like, this class is so difficult, but I love it so much, which I, I really liked hearing. And so when you're going through material aggressively, it's very important to remember to come up for air, to cover the big picture, because I frequently offer them like five point bonus on their homework. How do you do all the class so far? What do you understand well? What don't you understand? And I commonly got, I don't understand the big picture of how this all ties together. And I appreciate that. I can't count the number of times I've been in a class. I'm like, okay, why am I learning this? Why is this important? And the teacher never explains it unless they're specifically asked. <coughs> Another strategy is, because I wanted to teach a lot, I continued teaching them on assignments, on the homeworks. I gave them something new that I didn't cover in class. Basically, 20% of every homework was making them do new stuff, but applying the skills and techniques and fundamentals that I uh, explained in class. And then, lastly, one of the most important strategies is to keep them inspired. If you keep them inspired, they will solve that knowledge gap problem on their own. They'll go out and do the research, they'll do the Googling, um, and they'll come to class having done the reading. It's like, wow. <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time I was in class and you know everyone had done the reading. So, we can't pay. Um, I, I play D&D, I'm a dungeon master, not by choice, it's because no one else wanted to be it and I was the only one capable and creative enough. And so, for the basically flow of the class, I always uh, made sure to every now and then discuss ethics, bring up the disclosure debate. Um, also, aside from making sure all the topics flow well and making sure people understand the big picture, 
provide anyone who wants to learn more about the subject with external tutorials, extra help, homework solutions, and uh, I had to coordinate the guest lectures and the travel, which is more complicated than it should be, and what the goals of the guest lectures are and what their expectations are. Um, you have to make sure you have a clear understanding of any guest lecturer's expectations of the students and uh, what they want to teach in order to uh, be very successful. So in 15 weeks, I delivered, uh, with help, 23 high content, fast paced lectures. All of them are videotaped almost, and they're all on YouTube right now. I had actually was worried about if I was videotaping everything and providing them to the students right away, if people would just stop showing up class. I had a very, very high attendance rate the entire semester, which actually I, I was a little bit surprised by. Um, all, almost all the homeworks are CTF style. And uh, I had two homeworks, and I painstakingly took noobs and made them leave. And uh, like I said, I didn't teach them the tools till the very end, so I didn't make any script kiddies. At least we'll find out by the end when I grade everything. Um, <laughs> so the advanced topics that I set out to teach were raw um, memory analysis of running exploits um, and understanding how things work. So understanding why things are, why payloads are polymorphic, and once they're actually running, what they actually look like after they decode and stuff like that. Um, we were going to have a UAV drone hacking workshop, uh, but the parts never came in from China. I think someone in China saw my lecture on cyber warfare and decided to cancel the shipment, I'm not sure. And we had a, a, a workshop on lock picking. And so yes, I taught lock picking in a university class. Um, and so, Grading was pretty straightforward. Homeworks were one of the biggest things about the, uh, the grade makeup. And I really didn't care about the lateness as long as they had the work turned in before uh, I presented the solutions. And that's because, you know, attackers really don't have deadlines. Bad guys break in at the weirdest times. And so the results from the campaign were actually pretty great. Students have frequently been asking for an Offensive Security 2 class or Advanced Exploitation. And some of my students have, uh, that are graduating have jobs at really high profile incident response teams, which I was pretty happy to have a part of influencing. Um, the students are now totally excited about DEF CON, and uh, well, some more were gonna be here at B-Sides, but I think they were being crushed by this uh, project in the beginning of the semester. So I reused a lot of CTF questions. I actually reused a zero day against students. <coughs> I found a zero day in a CTF. It may have been an end day that they disclosed in the, the vendor's like, I'm good crap. Um, it was anti, uh, reversing anti-debugging zero day that if you loaded the binary up in GDB or IDA, they would crash right away. So I'm like, here's the problem, get the key. Just complete CTF style. And so they had to binary patch it out and it was a great way uh, to expose students to these topics because they can put it on the resume that I understand what zero days are, I've had to deal with them. Um, so students actually love the homework. So I had a student that, uh, <clears throat> She said she spent eight hours straight in the library and she loved every minute of it. I'm not sure if she's sucking up, but she seems to generally mean that. Um, so, blah, 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 blah. I did too much work. Main lesson here is get a TA. <laughs> um, other results is I hear weird rumors about myself, like I can wear sandals on the moon. Um, and now I have a big stick to beat up the other faculty um, because. I definitely have something to say about how, how they can teach stuff a little better. Um, so the overall lessons from this is if you think you can do this and you're inclined to do this, I say totally go for it. Follow Dan Guido's outlines, follow mine, my lessons learned. Um, it's hugely rewarding. I have guaranteed jobs for life just teaching this. Uh, and get a TA to grade, find guest lecturers to teach your weak areas, use existing material, steal from me. It's all Creative Commons. I just want credit. If you reuse it, take it, build upon it, it's out there. Uh, it's out there because I understand the best way to be successful is to give back to the community. And so that's what I was trying to do here. The other lesson is keep the bar high and inspire the students and they will surprise you. They will fill that knowledge gap and they will solve problems uh, on their own. And lastly, you will actually, if you do this, you will learn a lot from your students and, and from teaching if you haven't taught before. Um, last. Last big thing is, 
I strongly urge you to videotape your lectures. And a lot of people are cautious about this because they fear immortalizing their mistakes. Um, if you preface something you're unsure about with, with, I am not sure about this, but I think it works like that, that's a fine way to go about being wrong. And if you correct it by the next class, you're fine. And I make a lot of mistakes. I teach, taught this all on my own. I didn't have you know, five professionals doing it. Um, so if you videotape, it really helps to put them online quickly. The students universally said that videotapes were extremely useful for doing the homeworks. Um, and it allows you to teach a much faster paced agenda. Um, and so, anyways, at the end of it all, really, I just need some sleep. And so it was fun teaching this class. And if you, if you want to learn these subjects, um, you can sit at home on a weekend and watch the videos, do the reading, do the homework. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> no? All right, thanks. Oh, you got a question. <laughs> What's your question? Parents want to tell Elizabeth I hacked something. <laughs> you have something? She hacked something. She, she hacked something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you hack the Gibson? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you.